Hi there. Oh, there. Now I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> how are you? How are you this evening? I'm I'm sitting in my car. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a have to go see a movie with a friend, and I'd forgotten that I had made the arrangement, so I have to leave mm. early. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm underprepared for tonight's call, so <laughs> I won't be much. <laughs> I'll just be able to sit here. Well, it's, we're only talking about heaven and earth, you know. It's oh, yeah. Major, Small stuff. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Slaughter Dyke's slightly cosmological. <laughs> <laughs> I actually looked at um, Critique of Cynical Reason from him. Uh huh. I haven't recently. read that, so. Yeah. That was his big popular book, I guess, in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, I was really looking for his anti-Hitler argument, which it's got quite a bit of his interpretation of fascism. and so. Yeah, that's a, a con <laughs> controversial issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess he's being used by the neo-nazis is he in some ways but he's uh his his 1987 argument doesn't seem particularly controversial in that way hi hi, hi jeffrey hi johnny <clears throat> so how is everybody good mm-hmm I haven't seen you in a while, Heather. You've been I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> we missed you. Thank you for missing me. Yeah. <laughs> it's bliss to be missed. <laughs> so Douglas is the Cosmos host tonight. <laughs> What's that? I said we need all the help we can get with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I won't be much help tonight. I'm behind on my assignment. Well, I'm a little bit behind, too. I got stuck. Yeah. Here's mindful. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Greetings. Hi, so, yeah, the name Cosmos Host does not mean I know anything about the cosmos. <laughs> <clears throat> Why do you have that name? <laughs> That's part of the infinite conversations or the co-op. Um, I worked with John uh, last week to set up a conversation with Lisa Marowski, if you're familiar with her. But uh, So I've, I'm trying to play the, the Marco to relieve him of some duties. <laughs> Except obviously I don't know how to change my own name back to Duggins or Oh. <laughs> you need an infinite augmenter. Or cosmos. Just to... <laughs> Hi, Heather. Glad you, glad you could join us tonight. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm a little behind, though, so don't expect greatness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, are you going yeah, to the period? I find it to be pretty challenging material, actually. Or just, it not... I don't know if it's challenging, but it does require going a bit slow and kind of chewing over it a bit. And I don't feel like I have the space to have patience with Slaughter Dyke. I, I, f I find him pretty easy to understand, but I don't have patience for him right now. <laughs> that's, that's understandable. Are you going to the Terry Patton book release, Marco? Well, actually, that's a good question. It relates to our writers group because... We were planning to meet that night, okay, the twenty second. However, Doug has suggested that we meet a week later because he has something going on that night, and I was non-committal. Uh, I wanted to see what others wanted to do, and um, but if if there's no problem or no objection with moving it to the twenty ninth, that is to say, the writers group, then I would go to uh, Terry's, uh, uh, you know, cool. book launch. Uh, that might be a good chance for us to say hi. <laughs> yeah, that would be actually. Uh, so we put it to the group, but pretty much 
uh, the other, except for Zachary, the others who would be there are, are here in, on the show. Yeah, didn't we already have a discussion about this? I think it was fine to move it to the It's now. fine with me. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let it be done. Then <laughs> the 20 just, that, just, just post it so Zach knows. Yeah, will do. Hello, TJ. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, TJ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you emerge from the nether regions <laughs> that was a very interesting uh, comment I hope I'm not channeling deals above <laughs> although Slaughter Dyke does say history is the history of animations from div dividing space in two so either Satan's historicity is because of his isolation or Slaughter Dyke speaking out of both ends of his uh, <laughs> mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I get started, Marco? I'm, a, I'm just a bit worried about my time because I'll have to leave. Uh, oh, correct. Yeah. Uh, in please. about uh, half an hour. So, um, you know, I actually, before to... we do, let's just be clear. Uh, you, you're leaving in half an hour. Does anybody else need to leave earlier? Okay, so typically we go an hour and a half. We spill over oftentimes to two hours, but we could set a tar target time. Uh, hour and a half, two hours. Maybe we should give an hour to each chapter, but I'll let you, we'll, we'll see where how it goes. Over to you, uh, Jeffrey. Okay. Okay, it's just, um, so I was happy to volunteer. I, because I found chapter five such a complex chapter, I took lots of notes because it, it would help me make sense of the chapters I went. So that was sort of made me in a good position to be able to say something maybe cogent about it. But uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to work my way through my notes. Um, so it's this idea of, so it, it's essentially the ch chapter on heaven. So chapter six is on hell and chapter five is on heaven. But it's this idea that, heaven isn't a simple thing. So uh, it, in Slaughterdyke's idea, it's two orbs that overlap in space, but are in some sense incommensurable. Uh, one is, he, he calls it geocentric, but he actually means anti-geocentric uh, in the sense that it's God is on the outside and hell is on the inside. And then the other one he calls theocentric, which is God on the inside and the nether reasons on the outside. So it's these two overlapping um, orbs. Um, the second one, he talked about uh, Plato's sun parable uh, as the origin of idealism restructures the world into two camps. Um, a camp which is thought. So, I mean, we, we sort of know this about Plato. Plato's idealism is this idea that thought has a sphere of its own or ideas or concepts have a sphere of their own and then the world is a separate sphere. Um, but I thought it was... And then Plato's treatment of light bridges these two uh, orbs, at least the way I understood it. Um, and then there was this idea that because the material world is uh, remote from God, it, it's inert or dead, uh, which is the comment I made on line about the fact that it's, it's another way of, instead of viewing the world of things as dead or inert because we have a scientific perspective, this idea that they're far from God is another argument behind the idea that they're inert, um, which I thought was an interesting argument. Um, he argues that life is, has immunological goals. Um, and he, he makes an argument that the fact that life has immunological goals is what leads to the spheres because it has this idea of, of things moving outward and then turning around and coming back, which is then the idea of a sphere that's formed from this outward moving thing and then the return. So in a way, it's a kind of 
motivation for his fear ideas. Although I have to say, when I read that, I thought it's only spheres if they move out and move back at the same speed. If they have different speeds or different intensities, the result isn't a sphere, it's something much more complex. But um, so anyway, that was a personal sort of injection. He also had this interesting argument about the injection of the infinite, where he argues that the fact that the idea of infinity comes into discourse in the Middle Ages is what leads inevitably to the destruction of the spheres, the medieval spheres, and the emergence of some form of modernity. So it's this, um, so he dates it back a long way in time, which I also thought was interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, he, he, he has this argument about religion collapsing because of its own inherent contradictions, which he goes into quite a bit more depth in chapter six in the, in, in the, the sort of contradictions that are involved in the ideas around hell as well. Um, uh, so to believe in God becomes self-defeating in an infant God to, according him to Sloterdijk. And then he had this idea of the romantics emerged out of this paradox. The, the romantics tried to find a middle ground between a world that has infinity and a world that has God uh, in a way that reconciles the two. And he sort of says, well, they, they did an okay job, but they didn't quite succeed. Um, which I thought was also an interesting argument. Um, and it gave birth to a renewed immunology out of that. So the sort of coming into the modern era. Um, I, I really like the quote from Plotinus. So for all is transparent, nothing dark, nothing resistant. Every being is lucid to every other in breadth and depth. Light runs through light. I thought that was a really interesting uh, quote. Um, Every individual is the center of a system of emanation. That's a quote that he cites from Novalis, which I thought was also an interesting comment. Um, I have a couple of other comments here, but, or readings, but I don't know. Um, so it is therefore absurd to claim that European eccentering or decentering in world political, world theoretical, and world theological terms began in 1945. The real decentering processes followed impulses extending back to the rise of the mystical wave on the eve of the 13th century. Mysticism is the acquired immunodeficiency of regional ontologies. One catches it through, and this is kind of a joke, unprotected thought intercourse with the stirred up concept of the infinite. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Not sure if that's useful, but it's certainly my readings of the chapter. Jeffrey, <clears throat> would you suggest a question to the group that um, mm. might coalesce the stirrings of the infinite that you dropped at the end there? <clears throat> well, it, it's sort of um, this argument that... Um, that if you put the infinite in, you're forced to go to the very extremes of the infinite. And then if you do that, everything starts to come apart. So, uh, and I think, uh, I think as a scientist with some background in astr astronomy, that certainly corresponds to my understanding of the infinite in a way. 
So I'm not sure what the question is exactly. Is it how do how do how do your understandings of the infinite tie into that, or does that correspond to your understandings of the infinite? Or I think it is an interesting question because it's part of the other discussion about the integral is also a discussion about the infinite in a, in a different way. So maybe there's a question there as well. Yeah, I'm wondering what the question is. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to lose it through the course of the book. I, 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 gain, I gain these moments of clarity or insight where I feel like I'm seeing the sort of metamorphological argument that Sloterdijk is making. But then I come to these moments where I'm like, what's the point? <laughs> and what, you know, and of course, that, that's a, could be just an expression of frustration or an expression of exhaustion. <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of words uh, to, 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 to digest, to metabolize. Um, but this question of the infinite, I think, is the one that most um, resonates with me uh, because it it really I think speaks to the um, you know the place at that edge you know where where a form or there an inside and where we're an inside and an outside or you know where you know we don't know what happens next because the the forms the frameworks the models whatever that we have to understand phenomenon to understand our lives and you know what we're actually doing here um are not clear uh so i know that we're on our way to the foam and this is kind of like the the maximal sort of extension of the finite you know before the infinite just you know breaks apart any presumption of a totality so there's no totalities anymore. But that's a kind of to totality in its own right. Like that's the sort of performative, you know, contradiction of postmodernity that, um, uh, you know, that there's no meta narratives, that itself being an, a kind of meta narrative. So I, mean, I think part of what Sloterdijk is doing here is unfolding a meta narrative. And here we are in the middle of it, right? The, this if we take the sort of circular nature of philosophy that he's um, a couple of times mentioned seriously, then we're in the center of the circle of his, of, you know, of his, of his trilogy, right? These literally would be the, the central chapters in the, you know, the schema of it. And here we are in, in heaven and hell, but this is going to decompose into foam. And, and the infinite does that, right? I mean, in a sense, it deconstructs the globes. Yeah, <laughs> that that's the way I understand it. Is it's it's an argument that takes us. In fact, I think it's in maybe it's in chapter six. There's the first clear mention of the foamology. Um, so he he's kind of preparing or leading us into something here, right? And the devil is the precursor to to the foam because the devil devil is the ultimate concentration of individual self-referentiality and that's the that's what that's the base level existence or the base kind of ab atomic unit of foamly existence in the world yeah indeed he he, he mentions the existentialist sartre in relation to the devil right so there's a a relation that he makes this idea of being in the world or being in hell as being somehow equivalent no exit uh, yeah, no exit. I had written in no exit long before he mentioned it. So, uh, I think it's hard to talk about the two chapters independently. You may have to end up cross cross referencing both. I guess I might start. I, I don't know if there was a question in there, Jeffrey, <laughs> um, as you were requested to do, but um, I, I'm. My question is kind of what is the significance of all this and not sort of in the similar mode of what Ed might say, like how is slaughtered I relative, relative to anything we're doing here. Um, but at this point, in order to stick with the chapter, 
because um, we, we've kind of experienced infinity as the contemporary human being that we are. Um, so to kind of take a step back into the realm that he wants us to reside in for however long and go through 150 pages of determining where where God is or where where our surrounding uh, immunology sphere is um, like we we've as as those living within um, the postmodern world or our current situation I think we've we've kind of already gone through both heaven and hell multiple times and um, so that that's kind of where I'm at is I, I, I didn't get that. I, I mentioned in the forum that I didn't get that emotion. There's no emotional connection to what he's, he's not trying to make us say, Oh, well, this is the ultimate moment of realization infinity. Um, I, I didn't realize it through the reading. I didn't experience it emotionally. Um, so for me, like the significance of it is like, it, it seems like it should be quite revelatory to realize that all our conceptions of heaven, God, perhaps even hell might, might just be um, a story or um, something that's collapsed. So that, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say about that is what, what exactly is the significance um, relative to our reading? without stepping immediately into our postmodern situation. Can I, can I respond? Please do. Um, I got stuck um, many times. I, I, I got this word, theofugal dynamics, crypto, heliocentrism, or photocentrism. He gives you a choice between either one. I don't know what either one of them means. Um, I know what heliocentrism is, but what is crypto heliocentrism? <laughs> this, uh, the masters of light speculation, he lists Plato himself, Plotinus, Proclus, Iambicus, Pseudo Dionysus, were aware of the metaphorical and authentic character of their heliological phonological, and radiological discourses. So he lists five writers, one Greek and the rest of the Roman, over a 900-year period, and he makes this grand um, statement that they were all aware of the metaphorical and authentic character. And I'm going, huh? I don't get this. And then I remembered... And this is maybe stepping out on a limb, and you'll have to forgive me, but I have to um, quote Martha Nussbaum, very distinguished philosopher. And she's uh, reviewing Judith Butler, a feminist writer. And she says something, and everything she says about Butler, the same problems she's having with Butler are the problems that I'm having with Schlotterdijk. And I just want to share my suffering here. Um, <laughs> it is difficult to come to grips with Butler's ideas because it is difficult to figure out what they are. Butler is a very smart person. In public discussion, she proves that she can speak clearly and has a quick grasp of whatever is said to her. Her written style, however, is ponderous and obscure. A further problem lies in Butler's casual mode of illusion. This is what's, what struck me as very accurate. Um, this casual mode of illusion is epidemic, I think, in Schlatter died. And she says, of course, much academic writing is elusive in some way. It presupposes prior knowledge of certain doctrines and positions. But in both the continental and the Anglo-American philosophical traditions, academic writers for specialist audience standardly acknowledge that the figures they mention are complicated and the object of many different interpretations. They therefore typically assume 
responsibility of advancing a definite interpretation among the contested ones and of showing by argument why they have interpreted the figure as they have and why their own interpretation is better than others. We find none of this in Butler. The writing is simply too thin to satisfy uh, an academic audience. It is also obvious that Butler's work is not directed at a non-academic audience eager to grapple with actual injustices. Such an audience would simply be baffled by the thick soup of Butler's prose, by its air of in-group knowingness, by its extremely high ratio of names to explanations. And finally, she says that she talks about the imagined audience. Who, she asks, is Butler writing for? And she says, um, the implied audience is imagined as remarkably docile, subservient to the oracular voice of Butler's text and dazzles by its patina of high concept abstractness. The imagined reader poses few questions, requests no arguments, and no clear definitions of terms. Mystification, as well as hierarchy, are the tools of her practice, a mystification that eludes criticism because it makes few definite claims. <clears throat> so um, I think Nussbaum really nails it in her criticism of, and she goes on and on, and she takes a paragraph and she, you know, does a really close reading of it and she just underlines, as I just tried to do, much less expertly as she does, my big question marks. Well, where, you know, where's the argument here? What's, what's the proof? What's the claim? Where's the definition? Um, and I'm not saying, and also, I, I do want to end on a positive note, okay? Because I believe, I, I do want to make a contribution that's, uh, that's positive here. Just don't want to come down as a, you know, a critic without any, um, without any hope, because I think there is hope for Schlotterdijk, but I don't think it's in this, in this particular text. I think we have to go to his future, which I did in the world of interior capital. This was written in 2005. The first chapter is called On Grand Narratives, and he talks about Globes, the book we're reading, and he says in one paragraph what the book is all about. <laughs> and I'm not going to, I'm not going to, no I'm spoilers. Not going to share that because I don't want to just, I don't want to be a spoiler. Um, and another thing, I have another book of his, this was written most recently, You Must Change Your Life. And obviously he did change his in order to write this book <laughs> because it's so much better written than what, what we've got here. Anyway, so I'm saying there is a future for Schlotterdijk. Uh, and I think that um, maybe he found his voice. Um, but I think this, this, uh, this book so far, this, and I've done the first volume, this is the second volume, there's another volume ahead. I think um, for me, it's thumbs down. I think it really sucks. But I do think he's worth studying because we can learn a lot. I've learned, I've learned about this, uh, the cause, cause, the casual mode of illusion that Butler criticizes, I mean, that um, Nussbaum criticizes Butler for, and that I'm now criticizing Schlotterdijk for, um, I'm going to be very hyper alert to that in the future. Um, and also, you know, I'm also going to be very sensitive to that in my own writing. Should I ever try to do any philosophical writing, I doubt that I will, but at least I'll be more astute when I'm reading other texts like that. Huh, I think this is a little too casual here. Um, but I think there's also, I'm reading this. This is all about the same stuff. This is about general ecology. It's about environmentalism. It's about globalization, about planetarization. I'm reading this book, Variety of Integral Ecologies, all about planetarized, the planetary era. I read both of these books in about three days. And it was a breeze. <laughs> these are beautiful. These are beautifully written. They are, they're all essays. By it's a compilation of many authors, some of whom I'm sure you guys know. But I, you know, these these books to me matter. And I'm putting aside time to study Schlotterdijk that I could be spending in other in other places. I think more profitably. So I'm just expressing my my frustration here, and I can't wait till we get to Aurobindo. <laughs> All of them, all of them talk about Aurobindo. 
only there's mm -hmm. one reference to Schlotterdijk, one reference in both of these books on, on e ecology. So, the, so that's my rant. <laughs> <laughs> Never Ed's again. gonna love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> he just came chasing out of hell. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> no, I'm gonna stick with it. You know, I'm not. I'm not gonna. But, but it does feel a bit like Sisyphus. You know, with that, <laughs> and watching it go down the hill. And what was that all about? <laughs> What you said about boredom, right? Uh, you have to be ready to be bored when you're reading. Well, yes. we, we certainly get well, when <laughs> I was that. Fast, was right. <laughs> when I was reading fast, I wasn't having that many problems. It's when I started to read slow and started to look up words in the dictionary that I came to, it came to a halt. Because yeah. then I had to realize, you know, there's nothing going on here. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't, why should I work harder than the author has? Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I found myself doing. I was like working so hard at this and I realized, but he hasn't done the, he hasn't done any work here. He's just mystifying. Blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't mean you guys can't find something worthwhile. I, and and I, I know there are some wonderfully witty passages in here that I enjoy. But it's, it's interesting what you said about Butler, what you read about Butler, because Butler is probably one of the most cited references in the current literature it is extremely heavily cited so and this nussbaum <laughs> says that she says as much Ma martha nussbaum is a feminist as well and she has considerable experience she's worked well, in I, I read butler and i must admit it does correspond to <laughs> yeah she, uh, butler won the worst sentence award for <laughs> one year it was like uh, and this is one of the sentences she studies but anyway i guess it's about style you know, a lot of it is personality, I suppose. Oh, God. <laughs> but, and, and, I, and I do like Schlardyke's personality, and she's kind of charming in a way, but I think, um, thank God, what is it Oscar Wilde said? Every, every whore has a future, and every saint has a past. <laughs> oh. So I think he does have a future. I'm looking forward to the other books that I have well, of him because they seem to be very well written in comparison. <laughs> I think you just called Peter Sloterdijk a whore. <laughs> <laughs> Television personality, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, who's next? It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a mortal and finite being. I don't know if I have any way of relating to infinity at all. <laughs> it's it's so truly other if you think about it, and you're not willing to blow your brains out like Hunter. Or I don't know how he committed suicide, but <laughs> just dealing with these. Uh, putting, putting, um, trying to deal with infinity in the same, we don't even really have language outside of space and time, the finite space time that we, that we can put boundaries around to deal with infinity. Um, and actually I'm going to, I'm going to lean towards Slaughter Dyke a little bit. <laughs> because Ed's going to love that speech, John. <laughs> I think I'm channeling Ed too. <laughs> He's going to love that one. Um, this is from page 519. If life were merely a sojourn in the external form, in the external from the outset, and did not have to provide any immune services or observe any harboring interests in the small or the large scale, there would not be any need to talk of circles or orbs or hearths or arcs or city walls or anything like that. Life wants to reach out with freedom of movement, yet experience the privilege of being able to reside by virtue of an endogenous boundary. It's like the cosmic scale of things that, you know, in the cosmic scale of things, nothing we do on this earth matters because there's a scale in which you can't even locate the Virgo supercluster, let alone the Milky Way or the sun or the earth. But that's not where we live, is it? Our relationships matter, our decisions matter, the, thing, the consequences of our actions matter. So we don't really live on the cosmic scale. And I think 
one of the one of the things that Slaughter Dyke is pointing out is we we can't we can't rely on the old boundaries, but we can't get rid of a sense of inside and outside. It's just how we're wired. So his you know his 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 question going back to page 450, his question is a good one. Is modernity a post-metaphysical age? or is it just a differently metaphysical age that hasn't figured itself out yet? I guess that would be a good tying in that question about the infinite. What, what are we dealing, what are we dealing with? Or how are we dealing with where we find ourselves? I mean, isn't that where he goes with the world interior of capital? I mean, isn't, isn't that the, what he refers to as the second capitalicity uh, you know, from the era of, you know, the, the grand orbs, you know, which um, die. You mean in this like, book? Have you read this? I, I haven't, but he's 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 um uh is alluding to it or alluding to its future, I, I suppose, in in this text in a couple of places. I'll have to find the quote uh, for it, but I mean, essentially, he's saying that where this is going, what this book is about, is a sort of an um a diagnosis of the present. And so he's looking at what is he's really what is the totality of now? What's the totality? What's the uh, you know the matrix, if you will? I mean, that's not the terminology that he's using, but that we're living in now, because we could see the um, the form of it in uh, the past. And so that, that's what I think is the relevance of of this is that is that he's preparing, I think, the reader us as readers to see the ways in which we're still living in a kind of totalizing framework, uh, except it's no longer a theological one or even a, um, you know, earth, uh, co- cosmological one. It's a, it's a money one. It's one, it's one where money is the, the sun. Money is what goes around the world. Money is what ties the world together. Money is what's at, what is at the center of our concern. Uh, that's what's occupying the, you know, that, that void uh, in the middle. That, it seems that that's where he's going. We haven't gotten there yet. Like in this text, he's alluded to it in a couple of places. John, uh, you know, has, uh, he's wrote a whole book, uh, The World Interior of Capital. Um, so, so, and that's what is like the, where, that's where the infinite comes back. Because we're in this sort of infinite growth system, this like infinite, you know, money system. Uh, it's not infinite money, but it's like the infinite, infinite, infinite infinitization, you know, uh, of of money, uh, where our gods are, you know, the, who who are transmitted to to us through the media, are these figures of great wealth, of great fame, etc. Um, we haven't that, gotten rid of the idea of immortality. The gods no. were immortal, and now money's got to be immortal because we have to have that kind of totalizing framework that touches on it but we really don't understand you know we're still dealing with infinity being a totally different thing than the world we have tj what page was that quote on that you read about is modernity a post-metaphysical age if that was a quote 450 could you put that again please modernity as post-metaphysical oh um he, he comes after, it's on page 450, and he's talking about um, taking apart the Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmos and also the God orb. And he says that the question also determines the meaning of modernity. Is it a post-metaphysical age, as is proclaimed from every corner of academia, or a differently metaphysical one that does not yet fully understand itself? That's the actual I, I, quote. I, I can answer that. <laughs> This is not a post-metaphysical age. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> you know, am I? I yeah. have some. I have some. I have some. The American paranormal beliefs in 2005. 55 percent of the population believes in psychic healing. Telepathy, 31 percent. Extraterrestrials, 24 percent. Necromancy is that rising from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, something with <laughs> it's twenty one percent of the American that would be divination. <laughs> the Mansi is divination. Oh, divination! So it has to do with something having to do with divination. Oh, okay. But 
ESP 41%. So, and it, he said that extraterrestrial, among those who believe in extraterrestrial, there are all white men who believe in extraterrestrial abductions. And there are more black women who believe in communication with the dead. So, but uh, if you look at all these different kinds of paranormal categories and you add it all up, about 75% of the populations of Europe and North America <laughs> believe in the paranormal. And that if you, if you look at Africa or you look at Asia, I'm sure that that would be much higher. Um, this is from a book by The Myth of Disenchantment by uh, Jason Joseph and Storm. And I think there's a whole lot of people who, uh, who are really um, questioning. Um, well, this author is saying modernism is a myth. Postmodernism would be a myth as well. Um, these are just stories. And we're not moving towards a, uh, a mythless future. I, I think we all know that from our own personal experience, that myths are all around us. They're embedded in just about everything we, we do. So I do think it's an academic hangover, you know, from maybe the 90s when there were all those culture wars and postmodernism. But I, I, I think it's, um, I, you know, I just, I, I feel like it's a bit fabulous, the idea that we're living in a post-metaphysical age. But I think Sloterdijk's point, though, or where he's going with this, is that the, all the enchantment, I mean, the, there's certainly what you're talking about, like the paranormal stuff and the dreams and what all, that's a part of being human. But where we're really enchanted is in our consumer life, in our market selves, in our um, all of the ways that our practices, our social lives, our the whole structure of our of our existences is around uh, the market, right? I mean, it's around the products, the the work that needs to be done, the identities that we're forming in this these kind of globalized globalizing networks and that that sense of like this thing that's growing like beyond ourselves which is i think that where that infinite edge really or where that the edge at which that that we, we come into contact with that infinite and i would go back to to tj and question this um uh this this notion that the infinite is really other like is the completely other like is that a holdover itself from these metaphysical views that like radically separate the finite and the infinite. It's possible, but going back to what you had just said about the the systems that we build, the growth systems, uh, it's kind of is that is that an infinite edge or is that an immunization against that Lacanian real infinite edge? Mm -hmm. Is that a protection from you know losing it because we can always you know, we have more stuff or we can surround ourselves with, you know, with our systems that work. And I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but you know, that's kind of how I'm. So I really like, I really like the, the scarab um, kind of spiral image that was given. I think that kind of sums up the, both of the cosmological, the platonic and the Aristotelian quite well and kind of the path that we take where uh, it's a spiral which can be kind of the evolutionary aspect of it um, that we're going from one point to another so there's kind of a time factor which he slaughtered I tends to step away from but I I see us what TJ's what we're kind of getting at with infinity is not necessarily like there's possibly multiple in infinities, maybe. Um, there's there's the, the shooting out into the infinite depths, and that's why we have that, the second arc that we build around ourselves or uh, whatever second immunological layer uh, that he talks about. And it, you can, it, within time, I guess, which is where we're jumping into right now, within ourselves, each day we're going through that process of an infinite, inf infinite decisions from the time we wake up um, or take, taking in a, a smoothie and bringing that into our body as opposed to all the food that's around us. Um, but 
the infinite right we're we're constantly looping back to that one point and then at the same time we're we're saying okay well that was a nice meal that we just ate and we're we're back at our little one point and then now we're saying how much infinity can we we take in once again so we we go back on our our journey of the, the scarab dance i guess i don't know Um. why don't we use this pause just to acknowledge that eduardo has been trying to get on he may or may not be on we may or may not be able to hear him and hello so maybe he's just listening and uh, Heather, I'm curious what you think of all this. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned that I was um, impatient with Slaughter Dyke, and I'm trying to think about why and whether I want to solve the problem or not. <laughs> I think where Slaughter Dyke failed me is that he did not build his question compellingly in order to bring me along on the journey of all of this. I feel like this is way too long for what I feel is under the text. So I like to use like a felt sense when I'm reading of what does this hold for me? And, and that usually my felt sense is what connects me to a book very deeply. And I'll feel the exchange between me and the book. Um, so I'm interested and I'm curious about Slaughter Dyke, but um, He's not gaining traction for me with these long chapters of um, exploration. It's not even, it's like um, maybe the, if to use Gebser's terminology, like mental and the deficient. So even with integral consciousness, if we have a post dialectical text here where he's doing kind of a, a poetic wandering in search of these larger themes that then he extrapolates into the elixir i don't know maybe he's doing alchemy on us i'm not sure um or with us but i feel like um i wish he could he could have boiled this down and because he's performing things that's what it feels like to me it feels performative more than um necessary in order to prove his point and i was just reading the intro to um critique of cynical reason which i posted under the politics thread if people saw that no that's um, one of his books I don't have. So I posted the foreword. It's from the 1987 edition. And Andreas Weissen, I don't know how to say this person's name or if it's a male or female person, <laughs> um, goes into the history of his question about cynicism and kinicism, the more historical form that comes from Diogenes. It's a really interesting look at his politics because and the beginning of his project. So it's really like, why is he doing things the way he's doing? And I think you can find the roots in that uh, forward. And what I took away from that was the performance, the embodied, um, the Kinnick, like Diogenes, was more liberated than the modern cynic, which was more oppressive. So cynicism is oppressive, and Diogenes way of resisting the political structure was more um, liberated. And he's criti and Slaughter Dyke has a major beef with the um, oppressiveness of what is called enlightenment. So he has a major problem with the way that um, he says he kind of has this like paradoxical way of describing enlightenment, which I'm blanking on at the moment, but it's like saying basically like the fake enlightenment. <laughs> Um, and I, I don't know if he's using that term in a historical sense yet, or if he's using it in a, um, a broader sense. And I think the two are related because I think it all comes out of these historical philosophical conversations. Um, at any rate, the liberated uh, trickster figure of the Diogenes cynic is what he wants to return to. And I think that author of that forward makes some good points about how he's both doing that and failing at it and how his history is very superficial and people might actually find that to be the case and that his he's maybe post postmodern in a certain sense but also uh yeah so those are some of the questions i've been bringing to it i haven't yet gotten further with this text because i just feel like my question isn't here 
And if he had built it so that I could find my question, I might feel invited, but I don't have a reason to read this right now. So sorry to be, again, another cynic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you're like enacting the... The, uh, the, uh, the oppressive figures. cynicism? Yeah, the, effect, the figures he draws. Actually, it's at the, I think at the end of the, the uh, Satan chapter. Uh, the, Satan is like the epitome, the epitome of, of all the naysayers. Those I'm who sure refuse, there's, refuse there's no the accident. Love with the, uh, the absolute. <laughs> there's no accident that Johnny and I are doing this tonight, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well well maybe eduardo is able to speak with us now he's popped off and on and off and on can we can you try speaking eduardo i guess not hmm. i want to play maybe not devil i want to play God, God's advocate. <laughs> um, all right, here's my here's my theory. It comes at the beginning of chapter five, uh, and it ties back in somewhere later. It's all kind of mixed up for me though. But I I really think that his subject what Sloterdijk is writing about, like what this is about, is the whole, is God. He can only hear us. Okay. And I think that he um, recognizes that the experience of, uh, of that ultimate, that best, like, which he's not committing to a particular, he hasn't committed, to, as far as I'm aware, to a particular formulation of, of what that is. He's reporting. He's doing historiography, philosophical historiography, he calls it. This is how we've thought about it to this point in the West and to a certain amount in other cultures. Uh, but I think that he wants that, exp- he, he wants to t- to create the spaces for that a space for that experience like to think about what is how does that experience happen what ex- <laughs> let me put this again what space is required presupposed needful for that sort of communion with that sort of ex- relationship that sense of a whole i'm doing a poor job perhaps of articulating what what you know what he does articulates in many many pages but um so i think though that like the sense that it's a big book and it's sort of voluminous it's it's sort of spacious uh it require it it really is not enjoyable if you have if you have to do it (laughs) you know and if it has it's not enjoyable if if you have to like squeeze it into a compressed time frame because that almost like makes it feel like a little hellish you know i I was up at, I got up at one in the morning. Uh, I went to bed early, relatively early, but I got up at one in the morning to read the hell chapter. So like in the middle of the night, last night, I was following Sloterdijk's account of Dante and Virgil going into the pits of hell. And it was like a reading hell <laughs> because I was getting more and more constricted in the process of, trying to you know come to some relationship with this book that felt which i felt at other times in the reading process i felt sort of like wow this is really i'm getting this grand perspective and i'm i felt i feel like i'm getting some real deep insight and that there's even a sort of playful aspect even though i'm just like a little toddler running around on the soccer field with you know the the fifa players um but I think that something about the way, like I was thinking this weekend when I was reading chapter five, I wish I don't have to read chapter six before our next call. I wish we could just, you know, stop, have, you know, have, have some leisure time, no pressure, no, no bills to pay, no 
jobs to finish, no other books to read, nothing else to get back to. And, and I really enjoy this actually, I think. And I, and when, to the extent that I've had the times that I've had that kind of spaciousness with respect to Sloterdijk and this text, I actually really, I really enjoy it. I deeply enjoy it. But I mean, as we've spoken about in previous calls, there is this sort of aristocratic um, attitude uh, that Sloterdijk kind of just has. And I think he purposefully has that. I think he actually, uh, you know, that, that is something he affirms, that there is this grand tradition of thinking about relating to the whole. And it's not everybody who does that. Like the, the, there's a, it's a kind of um, madness in a certain way. And, and a lot of the times he, he talks about this history of Western metaphysics as a sort of mental illness. Uh, he, he, he references a book, um, my, my mental metaphysics, something like metaphysics as my mental illness or something like that. Um, he actually references Ken Wilber. Uh, in the footnotes uh, somewhere here. I think it's footnote number 46. And it was a kind of obscure, weird comment that I didn't quite get, but it had to do with like the big bang emanationist sort of presumption that he sees in certain writers like, like Wilbur, which might have to do with his kind of theory of everything idea. I, I don't know. Maybe we could sort that out, but um, yeah. Like the, like do who has time for the whole? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's, I think, the paradox that, that we're kind of in. Like we, we, and, and that's sort of the infinitism, that sort of infection of inf infinitism in the modernity is that we don't have time for the whole because we're always, you know, we're, we're trying to, to kind of fortify the, our, our defenses, our spherological defenses uh, through our bank accounts, through our job prospects, through, you know, Every, our lives against this this great you know other uh, doesn't the yeah. whole have to include the enact, enacted portions of our lives though where we're paying the bills and I mean because it seems like a whole that would be um, beyond that would would be a detached or an aloof hole I don't know <laughs> I think um something that Nussbaum says um, about um, Butler, I think I could say about Schlotterdijk. The real, the real danger, I'm, and I'm going to replace in the, her sentence Butler with Schlotterdijk, okay? <laughs> the real danger of Schlotterdijk's work is its distance from lived experience. So I'm stealing from uh, Martha. <clears throat> and I think it's, uh, if you're an activist as I am, and I wanna get a handle of issues because I'm, I'm very concerned about global warming and the economy and um, the rabbit hole of Trump's presidency mm -hmm. and um, you know, my own retirement benefits, if they're gonna happen, you know, um, these kinds of, uh, pressures that we all feel this lived experience you know i i read and study because i want to i'm looking for loopholes you know <laughs> i'm looking for a way out of this mess and i need assistance and you know i think that's what uh Nussbaum was saying she was talking about um butler uh seems to be writing for a, a few ha a handful of academic feminist writers who are just going to bow down to whatever she says. This is what Nussbaum, who is also a feminist, where she's coming from, is just like uh, for people who are practical and are out to try to make some changes in their lives and the lives of others, um, there's nothing in Butler's text um, that would help them. So I think that maybe after this book, which she wrote in 1999 before 9-11, I think the last volume was written in 2004. Um, you Must Change Your Life is most recent. The other book was, I think, written in 2005. But I find that uh, the, the prose is so much different. It's so, it's so much clearer. And I think it's because 
he started to get more serious. Maybe he felt uh, these other books he had the leisure to explore. I think it, I think it was uh, someone on this call talked about the, um, you know, the, all those big surpluses in the 90s. There was so much money, they didn't know what to do with it all. <clears throat> but that's not the problem, I think, um, that we're dealing with. Um, or that I think maybe Schlotterdijk or Europe is dealing with right now. So I think he's gotten a lot. Anyway, just the difference in the tone and the prose is very, it's very toned down, very spare, very simple. And they're vignettes. He like talks about Rilke, about 20 pages on Rilke, a poem, commentary on the poem. It's extremely readable. So I think he's not good at the grand narrative stuff, like he's trying in these volumes. I think he's good at vignettes. And I think the most successful portions of the, of these, uh, of globes is the, is when he does the vignettes. Those little anecdotes and stories and sort of, they have a kind of charm to them and sometimes a little magical quality to them. Um, but I think it's this grand narrative that just takes all the air out of it, out of the room. Some people can pull it off. I don't think he does. Or he does in, in this trilogy, but he does in some of the later works he's, that you said. I don't know. I haven't read them yet. But I, I, the little bit the, that I've seen. The tone spent. seems clearer. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, the, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to, get, to Doug, get back to Doug. You asked a question on the forum. Is Slaughter Dyke's observations opening up uh, new ways of seeing and being in the world? What do you, what do you? I, I still don't have a, an answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's your, what's your gut tell you? I, I would have to say for me personally, yes. And that, that comes from not reading bubbles and kind of infusing what I know, what bubbles is um, for the individual and the dual aspect of maybe the the other the significant other that's always with us um but it 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 did resonate with me and it, i'm not going around like shooting orbs out of my mind everywhere i walk just to um, <laughs> imagine that that realm but um it I, i've definitely mentioned spheres and bubbles and globes a lot more so i, I it it is sort of slowly creeping in um now that I've forgotten what actual question I asked, but I, it, oh. I guess it is helping me to see the world in a different way. Okay. This slow crawl, I, I love. I've mentioned I, I feel like this, if, if, if he's going to do a project of 2,500 words or uh, pages in three, three books here, then why not just go ahead and like make it a lifetime effort and just continue this on ad infinitum? And until <laughs> he just runs out of <laughs> little ideas to shoot out. But um, I, I don't feel emotionally attached as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not present and that's like immediate day to day um, activity. So I, I, I get the, the anti slaughter dikes and the, the pro slaughter dikes. I, I, it kind of goes along with our two chapters here. And um, so somewhere in between, I think we have something for me. Whereas I don't even see the, the logic of a pro or anti slaughter dike yet, because I don't think he's come out and said anything <laughs> or taken yeah. up a real position. I, th I think he's still laying groundwork. I think foams was, was, is where he's trying to get to. I this may be a very naive question, but TJ or anyone, have you, are there any new ideas here that you're aware of? He's made a lot of references to a lot of philosophers that I have not read or encountered, so I can't speak to that. Um, I'm not having much of a problem with his overview of history because it's not really contradicting anything you know that's out there in social theory or globalization yet we'll you know we'll see what the what the next couple of chapters are um 
it's not really for me new ways of seeing the world, but maybe just like a, let's make sure we remember where we've been in these cosmological or theocentric or geocentric orbs and circles first, and then you know. See, but I, I, I'm waiting, like like everybody has said, I'm kind of waiting for what is the point of your exploration here. You know, like Heather, it's it's kind of, it's kind of frustrating to be like, well, where's my question? That's a that's a good. Yeah, I get a lot of I got a lot of jargon. And some of it's interesting. A lot of new words. <laughs> yeah, Theo, theofugal dynamics. Not, I can't wait for the next cocktail party. I'll drop that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, oh, very playful with his vocabulary. Um, but I think in my search for what the hell does that word mean, and I keep on reading, mm -hmm. I don't. There, it's sort of um, someone. I, I read somewhere that if you if you come across a word that you don't know, and you keep on reading, your brain will be processing a search for that word you don't know. So you might as well just stop what you're reading and go to the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my if teachers I, used to say. <laughs> if, I, if I stopped reading this for every word I didn't get, I would never get a fast a paragraph, you know? Because he uses words in very idiosyncratic ways. And he also uses a lot of, I think, um, technical jargon that only a few specialists are going, probably going to get. So... That sense of not getting something new or a new way of seeing or being in the world necessarily. I, I mean, I don't know about that first question about seeing and being in the world, but not necessarily getting new ideas. I don't think that contradicts maybe if, if he's trying to do something performative. Um, like I was just reading Bruno Latour's comment on the back of my copy. And he says, Slaughter Dyke's infectious concept it's almost like the idea he's worked so much with viruses, right? And immunology. So it's almost like he's trying to, I almost feel like he's just trying to create a shift, almost like a, in a priesting sense, create a shift to where we see the water we're swimming in and that we see the way that orbs and spheres function and appreciate that and take that out into um, like, that might be the whole point, at least of this, this book. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but to see it at work and see it in many ways and see it deeply and re-see everything we've already seen. And that's a performative goal, not an informative goal. Mm -hmm. mm. Perhaps, so. perhaps to contradict what you just said there too, um, at this point where we are, he's kind of deflating everything that he's kind of, all the, the bubbles and the, what, globalism and spherology that he's formed he's with the introduction of infinity he's kind of l letting us see that perhaps even this sphere project isn't necessarily going to work out in the end um that's why he jumps into foams perhaps i don't I, we haven't read that far yet yeah we're all <laughs> waiting for that <laughs> so we're, we're kind of waiting to see what that is but in a sense he he almost allows any sort of there's a encompassing to go ahead and just either go too far out and we like there's even after we've read um what we know about uh, the long distance closeness of our loved ones that are gone or of god and even what we know of our our heart and the inside um bubbles that we have i feel like he's he's kind of he's it, it, still detached he's not saying this is the way to see everything but this is now a way a way and um the way we've seen it isn't necessarily what it seems i guess and so the introduction you of know, infinity is taking us anywhere <laughs> go ahead john it, it may not be fair but i think his um immuno uh the immunological uh theory uh of that the, the immune system defends itself from some external agent out there. Um, I think that's, um, there's a lot of thinkers who are rethinking all that. I'm thinking of Lynn Margulis and, you know, the, the Gaia, the Gaia uh, theory, uh, but the, like a cow, for instance, without the um, 
biomes in its gut, the cow would die. It can't, it can't break down grass without those, the, the bacteria in its gut. And that's just true of us as well. So it's like, it, it's not the self and the other. Um, it's very fluid and dynamic and ambiguous. And um, I, I think those immunological metaphors uh, are really tricky because the field of immunology is just full of uh, military metaphors, like shoot it, shoot it, or cut it out, or do something drastic. Um, but um, I, I think there's, it, it seems to me that this is probably not in the 90s, but there were thinkers in the 90s who were articulating some of these uh, alternative views about what the immune system is, rather than just a, trying to defend um, what's me and, or when, and what's not me. It's just something that's much more fluid and dynamic and much more about, um, it's not much, it's so much about defending an identity as it is about uh, working well with the microbes in your neighborhood. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know, I may be me, maybe overreading him or misreading him, but I, I think he gets a little too much of this uh, immunology as defense, hunkering down and defending. Um, I think there's, the, the immune system is much more complex than that. Or we wouldn't be here. <clears throat> um, yeah, I agree with that, but I think on with that in hand on the others, and he's talking about, at least in Globe, he's talking about history where hunkering down and defending wow. is kind of what all these cultures and societies have just kind of trained themselves to do over, over time. So, I mean, in, in a way, so maybe Foams is kind of getting into the breaking down of that that kind of definition of totality, but you know, we'll see <laughs> where he goes with it. But I, I think you're I, it, the ideas are complex, and I think I have to give him at least that much credit of maybe not taking us down a specific road because there are so many branches and there are so many forks and side, you know, paths to take. But we'll see. I'm well, still on the fence. <laughs> Heather's point about it potentially being performative, I think, is um, uh, suggestive. You know, like the, 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 the fact that th there isn't a well-packaged idea that you could kind of clearly identify and put to use uh, could be uh, a deliberate or at some level, a, de a deliberate intention uh, on his part. He may not want to play that kind of language game. Uh, he, he may really not, he may want readers who, not that they have leisure to, to, to you know, to sit around and read 2,500 pages of non-relevant, you know, to their lives philosophy, but who... <laughs> um, and yet here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? But, but uh, th I think there is a critique here. You know, I, th I think that, that not only is there, there's an affirmation of a certain like, sense of style, a certain sense of form, like the, the idea of space, giving oneself space, creating space for thought is, uh, I think, central, I would say, to, to this project. Uh, and the relation between space and time is... You know, that's really interesting. That, that that's he hasn't ta hasn't talked a lot about time, just in the same way that you know that in Gapeser you get this sort of despatializing of this attempt to uh, get out of the mental spatialization project. Like, Sloterdijk is picking that up and sort of I think at a different octave. Uh, I'm not I don't think it's integral necessarily because it really doesn't so far lead to a greater form. Like foam is not really a great, better form. As far as I can tell, foam is just chaos. It's just a sort of, you know, extension of uh, uh, um, <laughs> I'm losing my, 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 my sense of words here, but that, that, that idea of the multiplicities of self-centered individualities who kind of coalesce into these power centers like, and that's the real I mean, that's the real world but the integral move i would think would be to project better forms that are 
able to work with existing reality and you know, suggest a suggest a better whole in some sense. Like I think that that would be what I'm not getting in Slaughterdike. But part of I think the process of getting there may at least for me at this you know phase in whatever I'm reading because I'm committed to this. Uh, you know I have to finish it. Like I can't just drop it now. It would be so shameful or something. Um, uh, is like can you? how much can you like oppose that like totalizing influence of the pace, the speed, like the um, obligations of life? Because, you know, in, in, in this sort of globalized, infinitized world, I know I'm kind of slipping into jargon a little bit, but there, there's something just, I think, important about the ability even to do what we're doing, like to, like if we lose that as a culture, if we lose the ability to to read a long book and have a meaningful discussion about it, then what does it matter our technology? What does it matter how much wealth we build? What does it matter uh, how connected we are? You know, if we can't go to the depth dimension and sort of have that strong connection in the depth dimension, and I don't just mean like in this little group here, but I mean like as a cultural ability, like that is an ability that I think as a meta, a, as a metaphysician, as, a, as somebody making a diagnosis about the present, I think he's pointing to this deficiency in our just way of being, you know, that doesn't even let us take the time uh, to have the space to, to think. Uh, and what would we think about if we had the time and space to think about? I think that sort of like is suggesting that, you know, some people wouldn't Take, take the time to think at all. They would go for a walk or they'd play video games or something else. But some people would would wonder about the whole or would be shocked by the fact that they are outside, they're in the world, <laughs> you know? This, this, so this, this thought of the outside and this thought of the totality and where the outside opens to like being in the world, that's where I feel he's kind of, you know, we're part of our, our, the reason why we're so frenetic is we're trying to protect ourselves against the fact that we're in the world, in the outside, and we don't actually have protection. There is not actually the, you know, the, the citadel of, of, the, of the divine protecting us as individual beings. So well, that's scary. Well, what, what would happen, Marco, you were at the, for Lisa's presentation, um, he's into the orb, and Lisa did a presentation on another topological figure, the the not the uh, the Klein bottle. And there's also the Mobius strip, that's probably a little more popular, and even our own Limnoscate in Infinite Conversations. Um, I think all of these topological figures um, suggest that the inside and the ad outside are very fluid. And there's a there's a p paradox there, and I don't get that with the orb. I think that uh, his problem is he's stuck in one topological figure, and he doesn't deal with the Taurus either. Um, and I think he would be liberated, and we as readers would be liberated if he had um, a capa if he knew more to know, know more about topology. I mean, he just seems to be in a very Euclidean worldview. And, um, and I think that's what I'm missing here. Um, because if you, if you think of the Klein bottle or the Mobius strip or the Limnoscate as uh, analogs for um, this complex weaving of subjective and intersubjective and, and the special case of the objective uh, these kind of dilemmas that we that are perplexing us right now especially um, as we move from a, into a perhaps a third order where we are no longer just looking out there at the objective i'm the knower here out there i kn i know that subject over there that where the subject object is divided moving from that to something that's more fluid where we're no longer um, objective 
observers, but we are participants. We are observing participants. So I think that's a very different kind of um, world. And I think he wants, I think he's moving towards that. I just don't think he has the vocabulary for it yet. Um, or he did when he was right. He didn't have it when he was writing this. I think maybe now he may know more about this. Um, but I think we could help him out. <laughs> you know? It's like your your problem is you just obsessed with this orb thing, you know. To, well, you know, but I mean, the West was obsessed with the orb. I think was his, was his point and his historical point. And it's kind of like the um, the article I shared way back about the three negations. And it's. I almost wish he had spent, you know, in this 2000 pages, he had found some time to look into maybe the Vedic India or look into China and then kind of, you know, that might have been given more of a, a sense of some cultures we have an inside and outside. Some cultures it's a little more fluid than it's a little more, the, the negation is not subject object. And, you know, it's more of a negation of, um, what was it? What were the, I forget what the three negations were, but you know, just different conceptions, basic conceptions of what's in or out or what's neither in nor out. And that might have kind of given we're him both, more, we're you know, both, both in and out, right. And, and, out. and given yeah. him more, you know, more perspectives from, from around the world. But that's yeah, just... <laughs> like, a, like a, the yin and yang symbol. Right, right. Very Taoist. You know, these are, there are many other kinds of metaphor metaphors that he could draw upon, but he doesn't. Yeah. Right. And, again, and I mean, he's dealing with Western metaphysics, so I'll kind of give him that, but it, it, that might op have opened up the, his discussion a little bit better. Yeah, I think since he is grounded in kind of the historical aspect of it, um, he, there is the, the Taurus mm -hmm. when it's talking about the, the eye of God or the sun shooting out its rays, and then eventually they reach a point where they kind of rebound back or there's even reflexive universe, but there is the toroidal shape that forms. Um, I see the, the scarab um, drawing as the Klein bottle in a certain sense, like it's going in and out of itself. So he, whether he realizes it or not, he, um, in this historical account, he is accounting for a lot of our favorite shapes <laughs> no no i i agree i think he's looking at the historical record which has been euclidean um and i think the um i think we're living now in a very non-euclidean fractal uh, geometry and um i so that's where my complaint is it seems yeah. to be the update our we're, we're all in the process i suppose if we, we want slaughter dyke to do a, a systematic theology <laughs> but he's he's not really willing to do that or maybe this is his systematic theology and he, he well, agrees with all of it systematic theology yeah. i kept going with the footnotes after marco pointed us to 46 which mentions wilbur so um, i don't know if you read more of these marco uh, the footnotes I've been, I don't read every single one, but okay. I, I, I noticed that one. Yeah. Yeah. 48 on Heidegger. I, I followed it through to the end and it's kind of interesting. And 47 mentions foam. So I'll come back to that, but I just wanted to read this quickly because Heidegger does not realize this. I mean, there's some interesting hubris going on here. I have to go back and see what this refers to <laughs> because Heidegger does not realize this. He repeats through the anti-biologism of his fundamental ontology the betrayal of the living, which occurred in any case in the modern trend towards a neutral concept of being. In his late work, he attempts to compensate for this betrayal through an ontologization of the redemptive place and the word that is necessary for being. Conversely, Deleuze, now this is a um, part of his other work too, is to, he's not in favor of Deleuze's madness that's just totally schizophrenic. Um, he's looking for something else anyway. Conversely, Deleuze, following Fichte and Nietzsche, clings to the absolutism of the living. It serves modernity through an illusory praise of boundless becoming and floating mobility. Thus, two eminent thinkers of the 20th century only helped the contradiction between immunity and infinity to be expressed, but not to come into its own. So I almost feel like in that last line, his observation of criticism of Heidegger and Deleuze is maybe actually where he feels his invitation to help the contradiction between immunity and infinity to come into its own, to realize it, to enact it. Um, I don't know, just a thought. The one before that mentions a line of about foams from Hegel. <laughs> I actually think that that's 
I mean, it's it's good that you brought that back because that ties to TJ's point from earlier about I think the rel the relevance of okay, what what might be a novel philosophical contribution here is that sense that you ha- the the form spheres boundaries are necessary uh, and even if you can't have a total absolute sphere that perfectly represents or encapsulates the divine you have to have spheres at all different levels or fa- uh, levels of life uh, from the intimate local domestic to the you know regional and even to the global uh, and they have to relate with each other like they have to ha- be able to metabolize the outputs of, of each other like we don't have that now like we have a real like conflict you know between spheres uh and spheres are you know are they are complex and they're cultural and they're interior and they have they're historical and they're psychological uh and they're spiritual as well he doesn't talk about that as much but we're i mean all these chapters are about god and they have that mad they're matters of ultimate concern I think it'd be one way of putting it. That's a great phrase. Um, where did that come from? But I, I know it didn't make Chardin. it. Chardin. Yeah. I think it's Tehard de Chardin, it? right? It. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so we have competing matters of ultimate concern, and we have to get to some point where there's common, there's sort of a, a common level of concern on the planetary sphere level. And then at the relative levels, there are ways of, you know, managing the, or adjudicating or this is what we have to do, I think, as human beings, right? Or whatever beings we might become like that. This, this, uh, I mean, part of what he's saying is the contradiction of these forms, right? The, the idea that there could be an absolute that's completely separate from the manifest or the earthly, uh, obviously it doesn't work. Uh, it, it's, it's unsustainable. So I think part of what he's saying is that th- these forms that, we're, that, we're de- that I'm describing through all these pages don't work. And there's some sense of balance, perhaps, between you know, the transference energy, like the er- erotic uh, um, exuberance that, that he talks about, that spirit, that breath, that the balance between that, the way that that wants to move into greater and greater forms and then the harboring um, requirement of just of living sentient beings that need to have non-infinite uh, containers, you know, for their livelihood. Like being outside is we, is actually terrible. Like if, if things were not just right, temperature, uh, atmos- atmospheric composition, all number of conditions, like we'd be toast. You know, we we would die immediately. Like it's this very thin sliver of conditions that let us live as human biological beings. But then I think part of what Sloterdijk is saying is that there are certain psychological and spirit, spiritual conditions that we require in order not to be crazy because like being awake alive is, uh, you know, is to be exposed to the infinite and it's to be potentially insane. Um, so I was just going to throw a quick aside in there. Um, that's a that's a great that's a great series of videos. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson. How long would you live on each planet in our solar system without a spacesuit? And the, you know the average is a second, right? <laughs> you know everywhere else but Earth. So metaphysics is like a spiritual spacesuit, you know, for right, right, for you know human human beings becoming aware of of the cosmos, uh, and. You know, these old suits are in, inadequate. They tried to put everybody in the same suit. Uh, they tried to put, you know, some people way up with all the privileges, other people, you know, without them. And I mean, he constantly goes back to saying that the error of these Catholic, Catholic, and I don't mean Catholic in the necessarily the sense of the religion, but yes, in that sense, but also in the sense of totalizing. Universal. The error is that it always leaves something out. That enclosed form is necessary, but if, it can't it all, be infinite. That's if right. If it's a form, it can't be infinite if it's a form, if it's any kind of form. Hey, speaking of the infinite, uh, Eduardo is here. We can see him. Can Eduardo speak? Hi. Hi. Hey. Finally. <laughs> Greetings, Eduardo. Help us out. 
Yes, I lost 20 minutes from your speech. I can only hear but not see nothing. Oh, you can't see us? No, now, now I can, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Do, do you have anything you want to share? Yes. Um, I think this chapter is not necessarily bad, <laughs> but it's very difficult for me because I read in Spanish. Uh -huh. And I feel like um, it's almost like the second book is first than the first book for me. You know? I give this, I am with the cessation. For me, it's a lot easier to read the second book than go to the first. I think I'm gonna comprehend more. But um, talking more about this chapter, um, okay. I think he began to talk uh, that the notion of globe, the notion of bubble was substituted by globe. It's some kind of uh, immunological system based on theology or geocentrism. So I think what he's gonna say is that um, theological and metaphysics projects, they are built in the moder modernity with idea of orbit or some kind of gravitation movement around things or a center. And in this is idea of the empire, no? you know, if you see like in the past, a lot of big civilizations, they build themselves from a center, you know, it can be a political center, philosophical, cultural, or juridic center. And all the things to come, they almost like they spin around the center, you know, some kind of earth and the moon, some kind of gravitation movement around the center. And we can think, we can think things like houses, avenues, walls, or I don't know, some kind of conquering the space between orbits, you know. And the name of the chapter, no, he talked that God is some kind of sphere because they still have um, two very interesting characteristics. One is, you cannot say precisely where the end and the beginning of the sphere, he starts, you know? So this gives us an idea of some kind of infinite looping or some kind of ending and beginning, they start from the same point so this creates some kind of analogy of God, you no, know, on presence, on potence, and on sameness. And the other advantage to the spherical form is uh, the geometry is perfect to put things inside them. You know, people, gods. Uh, I think in the end of the chapter, he talked about the, uh, Lucifer too. He's all like his own world separate or something like that. And I think a lot of his, he is talking, have some connections with modernity, you know, with the luminous, but not necessarily this thing begins with luminous. You mentioned a lot uh, Copernico with this idea of heliocentrism. There is no like a fixed point or the earth is not the center of the universe, nothing like that. And he also mentioned the divine comedy, I think, or Dante Inferno. 
I don't know if I catch all those things he's saying. For me, he's very descriptional, no? This this chapter. But uh, talking about more of this cosmic theology, he's talking about the Dante's Inferno. He mentioned that the globe has a big center, and this center is God, with some bright and very lights. And all those lights, they create some kind of uh, animated expansion, expansive animation, you know? It's some kind of nuclear, nuclear explosion of God for all the sides. And he talked that in those globes have a very several points. He called the concentric spheres. That are, uh, these concentric spheres, they have points that are closer and distant from the center. So I think what he's saying is that uh, God cannot be divisible because God transformed himself in all those other points and himself. So everything is God in the globe. And he said that those points create some kind of radius, some kind of, it's almost like the, the light is called in, you know, through the center. So they create some kind of radius, get some kind of path, you know, to the center. And those distant points, they are some kind of periphery, like places distant from the center. And that is other advantage to the geometry of the globe or sphere. Because if you have a center in the sphere, the distance between the center to circumference, that is we call radius, is all the same, you know? So this gives some kind of unity or some kind of totality idea of God. He is in everywhere. There is no dark points in God, you know? And he mentioned also that deny this shape or deny this fear is some kind of uh, assume some kind of heretic position or almost like some demon forces is around you something like that and he ended the chapter talking that lucifer has his own empire i think but his empire is not like the empire of God because the empire of God has centripetal forces. So all things around these concentric spheres call those points, you know. In this vision of Lucifer, he said that Lucifer is some kind of egoist person or self-reference auto reference some kind of individualism you know because uh, Lucifer don't want uh, to share nothing he is stuck in his own world because the only thing he can see is some kind of abundancy of a lost world you know, and he mentioned also Nietzsche, I think, in the, the, in the end of the chapter. And I think this is very important because if you see the modernity is some kind of, uh, not necessarily an end of an era, but the way we think 
around those centuries was breaking, you know, the globe. They describe now is breaking, is broken. And the only thing that left was the nothing, you know, the infinite or the only dark matter or something like that. Because I think this end of this era is some kind of beginning of the perspectivism or some kind of multiculturalism that we talk a lot about today. And if you see all the culture in those in this period, like 14th century or until 17th century was based on ideas of the church, you know, the Catholicism. So the knowledge, the science, arts, and the ethics is all based on the church ideas. And what I think he says is that with the modernity, this cultural needs to change because the science and the knowledge, they start for his own beginning, you know, things like scientific methods, data, research, uh, empirism, some kind of phenomena that we cannot describe, but we create some kind of theory. So I think the culture in this period become uh, gradually changing and absorbing these no new ideas of gravitation and movement or orbit orbitation movement, you know. And I don't know if I catch all those metaphors on this aphorism of Nietzsche, but I think he's saying probably some kind of beginning of nihilism, like cosmological nihilism and psychological nihilism, nihilism you know, some kind of idea that we explain, uh, we explain things, creating no more uh, description of this thing, you know. For example, if I ask for you what is an orange, you're going to start to describe me the orange, you know. He's spherical, he's a fruit, he's orange, you know. You're not talking what exactly is the orange or what is courage. You're going to talk to me like you have some uncle that fight in Vietnam. This is not what is courage. You are describing things. And I think with the modernity, this becomes a lot more strong because I think what is, is Lothar Dyke saying is that all kind of humanism is ended, you know? If you see like, like um, let's say 10 philosophers, what they, what they say and what they build, it's descriptions of man. It's almost like you pick some adult guy, put him in India and you say, okay, this guy can talk. So he's, he have language, he can communicate. Let's build a theory about communication, you know? He's not concerned about these things. He is more concerned about not uh, who we are or where we came from. He is concerned about where we are. We know some kind of reshape the words that we build because where we are is more important for all those things because you need first to know where to build all those theories. If you pick, pick for example, Marx, he say that the man is a worker. So he built himself in a factory. 
And with the factory, he, kind, he creates some kind of symbiosis. This is some kind of materialism description of man, you know, or Habermas. He say that the man has the capability to talk and communicate. But this is also a description of a man. Or let's say uh, Sartre, he say that it exists is uh, some kind of primal form. And later you can build some kind of essentialism of yourself. So he is putting a description of a man on the existence. And like to resume all those things, I think that is Lotterdijk is building some kind of, I think he has no belief in things like human nature, but no. I think for him, all those things, they are completely artificial, you know, some kind, we are using right now some kind of uh, artificial intelligence to build, not necessarily build, but design the man right now. And I think this is very important because the beginning of all this, this discussion of the second book is the first book, you know, the answer to the question where we are, when we are in the world is we are in spheres, in bubbles or globes. And we create some kind of immunological system, but not necessarily a cage or like a, a room without a door, you know. You need, you need to create some kind of communication systems, uh, self-production or self-improvement systems like exercises, like uh, mental exercises, like technology. All those things for me function like uh, some kind of, I think it's quote, quote, global quote that we are putting around ourselves. And that's it for me, for all things that I read yet. For me, there is no things like animality or natural man anymore. Do you agree with, with Sloterdijk then that human beings or what, what, we call, what we call humans are sphere dwelling or sphere creating beings essentially? Is that... Is that what you've come to? Yes, I believe. Because if you see, the man cannot live in the exterior of something, you know. Uh, if you see things like gravity, hot, uh, winter, radiation, if you go to space, we cannot live more for probably two minutes, three minutes. So we need to design spheres, you know? And those spheres, it's almost like a, a onion, you know? We're gonna put bubbles, spheres, bubbles, spheres inside, almost like a, like the description of Dante Inferno, some kind of concentric spheres that are around the center. And I think this is technology, you know? You have some kind of design technology, design our bodies, design the world we live. And, uh, sorry, and design is not build or create or construction something. You know, in the first book, I think, very beginning says something about the Genesis and God creates the man, but God don't create the man. They design the man, you know, design is some kind of reshape or regroup molecules or the form 
or some kind of primal matter, almost like the merchandise in the capitalism. We are almost like living in a disguised world because we are not only see the, the first stage of the matter. So he says that God creates some kind of, some kind of doll that he called man with uh, Ar Arger, no, sorry. Uh, with clay, yes, clay. So this is design. No? He, he is not creating the man. He is designing the man on his own image. And he gives animation to this man like the bubble. He put his mouth on the nose of this doll and he blow some kind of spirit and now man, we gain movement, you know, some kind of, with the modernity, we see a lot of these things like with machines, with trains, uh, ships, they all move because they burn something, you know, like oil or vapor. This is some kind of design and some kind of gives spirits to machines too. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, which I don't want to take away from the momentum of your talking, but how, how does our metaphor of saying with technology, we're, we're creating as if God, we're, we're art, the machines and AI is, is a, a tap into the, the God realm, but how does this tie into what Slaughterdyke is saying in these two chapters here where kind of the orb is dead, God is dead. So are we just little devils trying to, what, what exactly are we creating? And um, that, that just seems to be like we're, we're tied into the, the money sphere or the story of money. And then now we're kind of tapping into the technological realm in general. We, we see that as, oh, that's the, the sphere that we, we should grapple onto. And we see ourselves as gods kind of creating through yeah, this yeah. technology. And yeah, so exa how exactly would this tie into what we read here? Yes, uh, that is interesting because the man rebel, you know, against God. And we are seeing a lot of this today, probably in the future, some kind of machines, you know, they not necessarily gain life, but we're going to lose control of these things, you know, like artificial intelligence and things like that. But I think talking more about this specific, specific chapter, uh, I think it's a lot of like you saying that we are like an uh, open field, you know, there is no more left and right or there's north and south, you know, this idea of globe suffer like a broken or become broke. And now we are in the middle of the nothing right now. I think what is he saying in Nietzsche too? I think he's going to confirm this because I think it was in the, in the aphorism he mentioned like a crazy man and this crazy man is looking for God with a flashlight during the day. I don't know if this some kind of metaphor for the luminous or he's trying to say that this nothing now is occupying all those environments. So we don't have more shelters or roof. And to see during the day, we need like a flashlight, you know? So this gives an image to the man of a crazy person, you know? What this man is 
doing with a flashlight during the day, you know? All right. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Heather. Uh, I was just going to say one thing. But I don't want to interrupt the flow if there's flow here. I was just uh, some of what you were saying, Eduardo, reminded me of a little of Kabbalist creation story. Uh, you started off talking about uh, clay vessels and light, and I got you know a sense of the breaking of the vessels that can't hold the light, and that made me think about a connection. There were these points that are part of the radius, and um, it also resonates. With Certain Western traditions, and I'm thinking about what TJ said about there can't be uh, it can't be infinite if it has some kind of form, and I'm wondering about the role of things like Sufi mysticism and Kabbalistic thought in what Slaughter Dyke is saying because um, I think it has a different yeah I, I don't know I'm just curious if anybody has anything to say about that. <coughs> to me, it feels like it's an absence, but. You know, one thing just on that, I mean, one of the key parts in this text is when he introduces the hermetic thought, he brings in um, Hermistress Magistus. That's kind of the moment, and it's really quite extraordinary, actually, when you look at these. Uh, I'd, I'd love to just look it up really quickly to, to um, speak to your question, Heather. Uh, but... I mean, the core, the key thing is this idea of this of a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, and you know, with that thought, like just the the that thought itself, like becoming like effective in the way that, like leading to the sort of like the pre the, the seed of destruction, uh, for for the sphere lot sphere forming total you know, the total sphere project, um. But I, I want, I mean, there, there's something about like the present moment that like I'm really, I'm baffled by in this. Uh, and maybe it ties back to sort of what is holding what and, you know, where, the, you know, where, where, um, you know, what, what comes after the collapse of the spheres, you know, and like what comes when the infinite and the finite meet. And that's like, where is the center now? If in another time you could have said the center is beneath your feet, in the middle of the earth, or this, you know, or or the center is somewhere, you know, in somewhere that's emanating out toward you, like where where do we actually experience it now? Like, you know, like beyond whatever the thought forms are, beyond whatever Sloterdijk is saying, like, I mean. Part, part of, I think, if there's some value in this, it's to see that this is the way people have thought about what is central, like what is really important, what has to be like guarded at all costs, what do you orient around, what do you orbit around, as you were saying, Eduardo, like, you know, I'm talking about money before, um, self, but like, does there need to be something more than just self-interest or just, you know, the growth of the economy or, you know, the next polit like, what is it? Uh, and what, what type it, of society do you want to see? That's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the anthropo anthropotechnic thing. You know, that's the, the what you were talking about, Eduardo, the, you know, the design uh, aspect. Yes. Hmm. I don't know, I think that he mentioned a lot things like uh, coexistence or some kind of solidarity and talking more about politics. You in America have like a big culture of people that let's say, make philanthropy, you know, things like NFL players or NBA players, they have all his own personal projects, like help kids or give money to some research of cancer. 
And I think this is my ideas mixed a little bit with Sloterdijk. I think like modern state, this is something that is, is done, but not a done that we, we need to destruct this state. I think that we can work in the future with this idea, like a uh, mix it of Christianism and what is what you like is saying right now, like big bubbles or big spheres coexisting. So you need some kind of self-transport inside this of those spheres or those bubbles. And this is some kind of, not necessarily generosity, but some kind of permission uh, acceptable of the other or to see the other like me. Now, like Slotter Dyke say, it's almost like the light is calling you to the center. So, like America is the big light of the world right now. Everybody wants to get in America, you know, like jobs, uh, money, big economy, like the immigration movement. This is some kind of terrestrial mobilization, you know, through the center, but not like a geocentrism center or theology center. We move with the hope that this new world is going to be good, but I don't think so. It's almost like a conquer the space, you know, the sea, the land, the earth, the air. We are doing this right now with the earth, you know. If you see and think this idea of, of orbit, the Earth right now is some kind of um, exowomb that that is spinning, and we are putting things to spin around her, you know, like satellites, spaceships, the uh, ISS. And this is, I think, the idea of Zlotodike, like some kind of a space that you can grow or you can build or improve yourself. Because if you will not do this, you're not going to survive. He talks about a second immunity, you know, once you lose the orb, that you have to find a second immunity through your own potentialities. Maybe. And yeah, I mean, I think that that's like that idea of taking matters into your own hands somewhat. I mean, that's what's, you know, what's the society we want to, we want to live in, you know, what's, how, how, like we used to, like you said, TJ, like how am I systemically possible? What would be the society in which I could take, you know, the time and feel totally okay with it, reading this entire book? And, uh, you know, not feel pressured uh, by, uh, you know, threat of nuclear war, economy, uh, tariffs, etc. Uh, you know, th this state of being is, it's kind of hellish, right? I mean, it's sort of, we're sort of in a purgatory. And that's kind of what, one of the things I got too, is uh, it was real too. Like the reading felt like purgatory. Um, but, but it's like, and that that concept formats like our exp our, exp our, ex our experience, and um, you know, is, is America higher up on that? On that, uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's, it might appear that way, uh, and maybe it is in a lot of real ways too. In a lot like, of ways, yeah. But... Eduardo has said so, so I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I mean, don't we need those goals? We, I mean, that was Nietzsche's point too. Is like we need higher goals, and the market doesn't give us goals. It satisfies wants and needs, but it doesn't tell us what we can be. Like in the, in that deeper sense, I think that that like somebody who thinks the outside, somebody who steps outside of the provincial or steps outside of the personal, without not not say to lose it, but to meet the other, you know, to find the other. Uh, now we're talking about Aurobindo's difference between the modern barbarian and the person who's seeking something higher, though, too. <laughs> well, I can't wait to read Aurobindo. <laughs> um, I'm, that's the kind of tension here. Like, I want to get through it. I, I, I want to get through it. We're, we've done so much. Uh, but I, I am looking forward to it. I, I feel like Aurobindo is going to lead us to something. Maybe this is preparing the group you know preparing the group mind in some way just the experience of this and you know the fact that we're showing up even though it's kind of you know it's hard work actually uh, i think to really make sense of this text can can i ask briefly tj you read human cycle and you i read the notes that you took on that book is there a relationship at all between the reading of varabindo and the human cycle and what um, this post-metaphysical question that um, he's posing here. I mean, I, I know that's an outrageous question, but... Yeah. Well, <laughs> you make any... we, live, we live for outrageous questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what, is there a, something in common that their two projects have, or is it just two different universes they're operating out of? Because... That's really interesting, and in and in the fact that Aurobindo is writing a hundred years ago, and Slaughter Dike yes. is very recent, is is very interesting. And Aurobindo, I think it's more about language. I I can't really say what the what the comparison is the, between the two because I haven't gotten to foams yet. I mean, I'm still kind of waiting for a point here, um, in in some ways, you know, um. Or Aurobindo knew what he was setting out to do. Yes, and you know he, what? He, he his, it's a collection of essays, and he was thinking about it. But he he started out with the point of I'm describing the vital and the intellectual and the super rational, and and I'm I'm starting here with with the history of it, and I'm going to build it. And he he spent the entire book building that argument. It's Slaughter in every Dug. paragraph. Yeah, every he's not. Paragraph. Every sentence has a structure. Right. Within a structure, within a structure. You, <laughs> Very complex. Yeah. I don't get that in when I read Schlotterdijk. But now... And what, these, what he's Marco's... closer to me in years. <laughs> this is a decade ago he wrote this. But he seems to me like... Whereas Aurobindo feels very much my contemporary. It's strange. Yeah. Aurobindo's not performative, though. Marco that's... and Heather's points about the performative. I mean, that kind of, I think that's also a difference in their style. And it really distinguishes it. Um, that's a good, I'm going to have to chew on that one for a while too. Cause that's a, yeah, yeah, please. I think, a, a big factor with the question you're ask, asking is Aurobindo focuses on the individual, whether it's individual perfection, even in the human cycle, it eventually gets it back around to the individual. And I mean, I might be, is that he, some, he, mostly correct? He, he, yeah, but he uses the individual's definitely part of a concentric, you know, attack, attack for bet for lack of a better word on, on the collective and the social. He doesn't, he doesn't, it's integral. I can't even really think of a better mm -hmm. word than, than that. And so, but so I the see individual, he does have to, he does, he does come from a point where the individual center, he's taking that seriously. Slaughter Dyke is, is trying to build more of a dyadic. And I think I know, He's doing it for other reasons too, but sort of like your your relationship is a dyad. If you're an individual, which nothing really happened in the real world, is a kind of more isolated thing. Whereas um, Arbin is very integral with it. It's it's individual and societies and nation souls are all you know concentric circles around the higher pull, the higher call. And I think Slaughter Dyke is focusing on the other I quite a bit more he's focusing on <laughs> i'm not or, sure where as opposed to <laughs> the individual he if you 
at least where I'm thinking right now, he he gets the the other. He he wants to give that answer to us maybe in the future, but it not the the big other and the little other the the other plays a major role, I think. In if there is an individual in Slaughterdyke, it's a dyad. It's a it's a rela- mm-hmm. it's a strong relationship. That's the basis of he, he he thinks of individual individuality is is Satan in the little constricted space isolation. You know, as opposed. So to- I feel that's how Slaughterdyke's a little more relevant to our situation in a certain sense because he's focusing on that but communal I- aspect. But isn't uh, Edwarna mentioned about uh, humanism and that um, Schlauterdijk isn't a humanist? No, he's he's kind of examining humanism as potentially deflated as well. I think. Yeah, Aurobindo is a superhuman. He's talking about supramental. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I would say that maybe Schlauterdijk would even say that the superhuman, maybe at this point, needs to kind of deflate a bit. It's a little bit too religious for him, perhaps. That's just a thought. Right. But Aurobindo's not guaranteeing that we're getting there either. But Aurobindo Aurobindo holds it out as an ideal. He was an exemplar of realization as well. I mean, he reports on his personal experiences of um, transparency, of communication with the divine, of, um, you know, psychic experiences. I mean, all kinds of things like that. These are part of his like his life world, you know, that, that inform his theory. And we don't really know, Solarek doesn't really discuss what his own practice or his own like real realization is, his own like actual insight. I mean, it all comes out through this performative, you know, philo- philosophical act. Um, and, you know, but he all, he is speaking from this space that, that, that where Nietzsche's madman was of, you know, he, the human is a bridge between beast and overman. And I think that that theme is really still here. Uh, and you know, he's not using those specific terms. But the, que- you know, the question, the, there is some sense of being pre- of human, the human project and partly through this mania of you know metaphysical globalization and the way that it's propelled technological development uh, etc that's propelling us into some new thing right because we're developing not only the capacity technologically through everything from you know genetic engineering nanotech etc but also the will and we have now centuries of things that we could imagine creating I mean that was the other thing. It's like everything that that that's in the that, that you could, that, that's in the inferno, in a way, becomes a template for what could be done in real life to people, <laughs> and, and system, ways of ways of creating systems of enclosure, ways of creating kind of you know hierarchies of reward, merit, uh, punishment. Uh, so now we have this whole repository of imagination of the things that we could create from all the movies, all the fiction all you know the, the the inventions but then combine that with the technological ability and also this immunologic immunological desire like Ray Kurzweil is a perfect example like he wants he's driven by psychologically driven and self-admittedly psychologically driven by the death of his father and wanting to recreate his father so uh the, the, there i guess i mean the 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 uh what I think Aurobindo, though, offers is more of like, okay, now what's on the other, what's, what happens when you, when you fling that, that, that arrow? Like, what is the other side? What is the superhuman, like, like you know, John, you said? Does that, that might need to be deflated in the kind of new age, you know, spiritual marketplace, I think. But if, this, if he's a real exemplar and if, we're, you know, we're looking for real, you know, people that have pioneered new ways of being then you know perhaps there's going to be more that we get out of that than you know we're getting out of Sloterdijk uh, because it gives us something to aspire towards uh, i don't aspire toward foam uh i would like to know about it <laughs> you know because it's our world and it seems to be an apt metaphor for social reality and just, you know the ways that that um worldviews collide but 
I may, yeah, I, I do get the sense of purgatory. I mean, I would like to, you know, like kind of evolve, <laughs> right? We have, and, and maybe just this analysis is making us a lot more, I hope is making us more sensitive to um, the real, like the philosophical history, the history of thought, the intellectual history that, you know, sometimes props up, cup, pops up in our language. Uh, like one quick example, I know we've been going a while, but like the whole idea of emanation and the idea of God as a center that expands outwards. I've always just presumed that I think in my worldview, uh, not always, but that's sort of how I've tended, but I didn't really know that it is rooted in, in the religious. I mean, I suppose, I, I suppose I knew, but I didn't really have the story of, of how that, you know, really is grounded in a particular conception of the world where, you know, one entity is at the center and all the other entities are arranged around it. And the practical effect for, for me is that when I start feeling myself orienting around something that feels like a center, I begin to question what's going on there. What's the story? And if God is a, if God is a, you know, sort of sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere, then what am I orienting around? So, uh, <laughs> oh, that's all. <laughs> this was kind of brutal. I have to say like, I, I yeah, I'm, I, I, I really appreciate this book, but it would be good to be done with it. And, and I still want to read foam foams, but not this year. Yeah. And maybe next year. After, yeah. after uh, the Aurobindo, I think that uh, it would be, it's, you know, comparative philosophy. We'll have East and West, and we will have gone through these experiences, and I think we'll know something then that we may not know now. Um, but I'm very curious about, I just love the fact that Aurobindo disliked Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> he went into trance state. He went into altered states of consciousness. And he used his subtle body um, to defeat um, Hitler's regime. And he talks about being on Normandy Beach. <laughs> you know? yeah. So he was, a, he was really far out there. <laughs> I heard one, one of the stories was that he, he was somehow sending influence in, and that's what kept Hitler from wiping out the British at Dunkirk and allowing yeah. you know, 300,000 soldiers to escape and, and all that. Well, yeah, well, so he would, and there there were many. Um, they wanted to get rid, get the British out of India, and if if uh, Hitler was fighting the British, they were fine with that. But he said, "No, that's stupid. Right. <laughs> that is stupid." And I think that's a very there's a very sophisticated um, geopolitical, biosocial kind of guy. Awareness. Yeah, and, and I think he was up against it. He was in prison. He was an activist. Mm -hmm. I don't think Schlotterdijk would be so convinced about anything <laughs> that he would go to jail and, you know. So I think there's a huge difference in their their psychological sort of makeup. But, um, so anyway, it'll be an adventure. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Nice to yeah. see you guys. Yeah, and we should start planning that, actually. Uh, It'll be soon, won't it? After this next... We have two more chapters left? Two more readings. Or two more readings. What, what? Well, let me, let me take a quick look. And then look. we'll start uh, probably the, in May, right? Yeah, so... so yeah, it would be and... about two more readings, I would assume. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, seven. Yeah, seven chapters? Eight. Chapter seven, and I think there's a brief excursus or something, and then there's chapter eight. Well, there's three hundred. Chapter eight is yeah. Chapter eight is huge. Yeah, there's three hundred pages left. Uh, so we should probably do chapter seven and then chapter eight. We could do it. Okay, just got to not leave it for the last week because <laughs> we're doing all the you know we're talking about all these other things and kind right. of forget about Sloterdijk and then it's like oh it's coming up again. We're doing the Gebser paper right for next. Uh, I wish you could be there, TJ. Yeah, I know. Here. That's one I'd like. I'm going to read the paper anyway, but I'll probably comment online. Yeah, please do. I, th I think we'll all enjoy it. 
I, well, who's the name of the CIS professor that has given some talks on Aurobindo? Oh, that Ben Ben Benerji. Benerji, right? I, yeah. I was just watching he's, one of his today, and he's brilliant, he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's a great resource. Yeah. Him. Oh, I have his book, by the way. Ben Benerji wrote a book on uh, Aurobindo, <laughs> and I have it, so it's a good source. <laughs> anyway, I'll find it over there. Somewhere. If you can't find it in the New York Public Library, ask John. <laughs> yeah, right. I got, yeah. It's pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> All these books. Thank you, gentlemen. I had a great time. Likewise. Thank you, guys, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> See you online.